just like we've done on the previous live shows, uh, let us know where you're from, uh, the school that you represent, the, the city, the location uh, from around the world. We're expecting a, a great audience today. And so looking forward to uh, a wonderful conversation with my two special guests. So um, hopefully you're, you're doing well. It's hard to believe that today is April 15th already. And so we think about uh, being all the way through halfway through April and looking forward to uh, hopefully some some changes coming in the upcoming uh, weeks and, and months as we're certainly all adjusting to uh, the realities of COVID-19. And uh, I know that a number of you have participated uh, with me and also with other organizations as we talk about some of the virtual enrollment and marketing strategies that you can put in place. and. Um, today's topic is really going to apply to this area because it's all about inbound marketing. So looking forward to uh, this conversation with our guests today. So again, let us know uh, when you join in the live broadcast uh, where you're from, and uh, we will look forward to uh, highlighting uh, your location in your school. And so I'm seeing a few people just starting to join in right now. So uh, grateful that you can be here. So uh, Jennifer's here from Hope Academy in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Great to have you, Jennifer. And Lakeisha from Hershey Montessori School in Northeast Ohio. Uh, I don't know if you're getting any snow in Ohio today. I was looking uh, at some of my friends who are in Indiana and noticing that they were experiencing some snow. So it's kind of a rude reality when you have the middle of April and you're still getting snow. That's one of the reasons why I live in Florida you know, I escaped from Michigan um, years ago, uh, back in 2001. So, you know, it's I was sitting on my lanai uh, just before this uh, Facebook Live show, and uh, it was, you know, 80 degrees and sun and clouds out. So anyway, a um, few others joining in. Melody's here again. Great to have you. Catherine's from Narden Academy in Buffalo, a school that I'm working with. So great to have you, Catherine. Uh, Megan from Ascension Academy in Amarillo, Texas. And Rudy Gesh, another uh, uh, guest that we had a couple of weeks ago on the show from Eastern Christian and Stephen uh, from um, uh, Clayton Bradley Academy in Tennessee and Courtney from Lutheran High North. And uh, great to have you here. And uh, uh, Sissy from University Christian in Jacksonville, Florida. And um, Lakeisha is also talking about the snow. And now it's starting to go really fast uh, because there's a lot of people joining in. Uh, John from Canada. Uh, Carla from Maryland and Jill from Milwaukee and uh, Kim from Northeast Ohio and uh, Catherine saying no snow in Buffalo. So that's a place where you get a lot of snow. And, you know, we talk often during our coaching calls. And so thankful that you're not getting snow. Lisa from Timothy Christian in New Jersey and uh, Courtney. Uh, great to have you, Courtney. She's now with FACS, but she had been a former director of admissions and um, um, Plum from Pittsburgh. So I'm not sure what school you're from, but great to have you. And then Katie from Ascension Academy. And um, uh, I'm not sure if I can pronounce your name correctly, but uh, from Massachusetts, Seobaum, um, I'm gonna take a, a shot at it. So please help correct me. Um, maybe uh, Peter and, and, and Brendan, when you guys get on, you can help me with that. Lane from uh, Richmond, Virginia. And uh, Katie's talking about having snow yesterday. And uh, Tanya from uh, Virginia. So a lot of people from all over and uh, grateful that you can be a part of our uh, live show today because we have a very important topic that we're going to talk about. Uh, it's really pertinent to what all school leaders are facing today as we think about some of the shifts that we're taking uh, to a virtual admissions uh, setup and, uh, and really focusing in on marketing and getting our message out to the community. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, special guest. And I want to start with um, a friend of mine, uh, Brendan Schneider. Say hi, Brendan. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rick. <clears throat> Brendan is the Director of Advancement at Swickley Academy. And uh, Brendan is also very involved with uh, his own organizations, Schneider B, and then also Markcom Society. So. You have your hands in a lot of things. Um, I always find that you're, you know, you're working all the time, trying new things. Tell us a little bit about these ventures and how you help school leaders. 
Sure. Thanks, Rick. It's it's fun to be here, and I see a lot of familiar names. So hi, everybody. Um, really, how all this other thing started, this Schneider B and now the Marcom was was that um, I started with inbound marketing in two thousand eight nine after. Uh, I guess we could call it the first stock market crash. And now we have a little one that's coming back. And it was really about vested self-interest. We needed to figure out a way to increase inquiries, applications, and visits. Um, we were trying a bunch of different things. We can maybe get into that later. That didn't work. So we jumped to inbound. Um, we've had success. And I really started my blog, which some of you guys may know, Schneider B, as a way to test everything. Because my thought was if I test it first under my own name if i screwed anything up i would screw up my own name and not school well i realize you don't screw anything up people just don't pay attention um and now here we are so thanks great glad to have you here brendan and then also want to introduce uh, our next guest uh peter baron peter's with the enrollment management association and so peter tell us a little bit about your background and give us an overview of the Enrollment Management Association. Yeah, so I've, I've been working with schools. I, I first started working in schools back around 99, 2000, and uh, had been working with schools in many different capacities over the years. And it's funny, Brendan, you'd mentioned like 2008. I, I just have a distinct memory of reading right around then this book by David Merriman Scott. It's The New Rules of PR Marketing. And I read that book and I put it down and like, all right, I'm not doing marketing the way I used to do. <laughs> it just completely changed the way I, I you know, thought about how do you offer content to, to, to families, you know, in our world anyway. So uh, yeah, inbound marketing has been a big part of, of my career for, for well over a decade now. And uh, at EMA, where, I, where I'm currently the chief member relations officer, we're an association of about 1,300, a little over 1,300 member schools. Uh, we've got a pretty diverse toolkit that schools can use to aid their enrollment process. And uh, I can tell you over the last couple of months, um, well, we started seeing issues with COVID back in January because we do we work with students applying to the U.S. through China. And so we started to see that impact our testing overseas. And uh, gosh, for the last month, we have just been our, our singular focus, right, is on bringing as much learning back into the space as we possibly can. And, you know, I'm glad I'm able to participate here because I think these these opportunities are, are so important for everybody who's on. Um, they, you just you just can't get enough of it, right? There's there's a lot of learning that has to happen. Yeah, and it does seem like there's a lot going on online. I know, Peter, you do a broadcast, uh, podcast. Yeah. I was going to say broadcast, but podcast, <laughs> yeah. EMA, and then, Brendan, of course, you have your your blog and um, your Snyder B University and all that you're doing. So grateful for all that you're helping, all you're doing to help schools out there. So it's really been been awesome. Cool. Yeah, let's start with just an understanding of inbound marketing. So, you know, I, I'm sure school leaders have heard about this. You know, Brendan, you have a book positioned behind your head um, <laughs> talk about in, inbound marketing. But tell us a little bit about what this is all about. Uh, I'll jump in first, Peter, if that's okay. Yeah, it's, um, inbound marketing is basically the ability to get found by your prospective families as opposed to trying to find them. So um, back in the day, uh, HubSpot is a piece of software that talks a lot about inbound. But back in the day, they used to share a picture of a magnet. So the idea is that you attract people to you um, mm -hmm. and you attract people to you through content. Um, an easier way to explain it is is to talk about the opposite, which is what I call uh, app marketing or traditional marketing or sometimes interruption marketing. So traditional methods like um, uh, an ad in the paper interrupts your reading, a television commercial interrupts your viewing, a radio ad interrupts. Um, the problem is those interruption methods are starting to go away. People don't pay attention. There's technology that removes them, satellite radio, DVR, who reads print newspapers anymore? I don't know. Right. Um, and now, I mean, really germane to what we're talking about time-wise is COVID. Nobody can leave the house. So you can't go see ads. You can't see billboards. You can't see those things. So um, that's why when you, you say, hey, let's talk about inbound, I thought, oh, that's perfect. So that's that's how I would define it. I don't know, Peter, what would you have? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think I 100% agree with you. Um, inbound is all about solving problems and helping people. And 
building a relationship that goes beyond me asking you to purchase something. This is me actually helping you. You can understand my thought process, what I value, you know, what is important to me individually and as an organization. And then, you know, amazing things happen once that relationship is built, but it's all about being helpful. And I, Brandon, you, you often talk about Jay Bear and like, how can you be helpful? I, I think that to me is, is that the book? I can't eat them. I don't have I don't have like my, <laughs> my 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 big boy glasses on here. Yeah, there you go. You yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's it, right? It's all about uh, solving people's problems and being helpful. And I think schools have an enormous opportunity in front of them, given everything we're, that's unfolding on the daily with us here today. And those are two great resources. Can you just show those again, Brandon, so everyone can see that? Uh, if you're looking for some good reads, you know, you're at home. Uh, pick up inbound marketing, even though it's been around for a while. Uh, it's an oldie but a goodie. And then utility, uh, another great one to be able to uh, focus in on uh, and add to your professional development library. So I'm always amazed of, you know, as I work with schools um, all over, you know, some have been slow to make that shift to inbound marketing. And if there was a time to do this, it's, it's now. And I, I hate to sc hate to see schools that are far behind in this effort uh, because, you know, real dealing with COVID-19 and all that we're facing right now, yeah. like you said, Brendan and Peter, you know, we're in a situation where online inbound marketing is really the, the only strategy that we can use to be able to work uh, and, and reach families. So yeah. I'm interested in um, hearing your perspectives about um, a school's website. So I often look at a website as your you know, your foundational core marketing tool. This is where you need to invest if you're gonna invest uh, in your marketing effort and every school should. But what would you say are some of the key ingredients of a school's website? Yeah, Brandon, you can go first. Uh, sure, I, I would say there are two things. And um, again, as I answer the question, I think within the framework of inbound. So, yes. So, and the, here's the struggle. Um, a lot of the um, website providers don't necessarily bake this in. So it's something that you have to be mindful to think of. And the first for me is having the ability to convert. The ability to convert an uh, anonymous visitor to your website into a prospective family. So basically, an easy way is just get their e emails um, or get the full inquiry. And the other piece that helps with that is landing pages. So uh, to have a landing page on your website, which is basically just a web page that is branded the same, but devoid of navigation. So the idea is that somebody goes to the landing page and there's only one call to action. There's only one thing they can do. Um, so that those are my two. I don't know. Peter, what do you think? Yeah, I, th I think those are certainly, those are critical, especially with the inbound piece, right? Um, I mean, a blog, you know, obviously that's something that schools should be should be thinking about i think the thing that i often come down come back to though is navigation and mm. can, is your site easy to understand can you find the information that you want in a timely manner and there are lots of ways to approach that and kind of pressure test it to see if your assumptions are right like there are services out there that for very little amount of money will have folks you know, give folks uh, a challenge, right? Go find this page on your website and they'll track how many clicks it takes to get there, right? And you can offer alternative navigation structures so that you can see which 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 structures are more most efficient. But, you know, if you, if you think about um, the amount of time that people are gonna spend on your website as they're trying to like, I, so let me back up. We went through this process a couple of years ago with our daughter. So she's at a, a private school out here in Seattle. And I was amazed at how hard it was to find information. Like I, and, and I'm online pretty often. I've got a lot of experience <laughs> working with websites and uh, it was really astonishing that I, I had to struggle to find some basic information. So you know, I think that's there. If you think about it from a low hanging fruit po point of view, I think, you know, site navigation is something that could immediately help you stand out from your competitors because we're all kind of doing it the same way. And that's not necessarily, you know, there's value to being part of what the crowd is doing, but I think that there's some tweaks that you can make to, to improve that part of your website. Yeah, one of the things that I'll add in, because I definitely agree with what you guys are sharing, I think a website needs to focus in on the story of your school and stories of your people and programs. 
because I, one of the things that I think a prospective parent is looking for is they want to find potentially other people like them. They want to see who the teachers are. Um, they want to understand, you know, the successes of your alumni. So all those story stories become a key ingredient to your website as you design that moving forward, because that'll help keep a viewer once they get to your website as they're looking around and you know, engaging with the, the stories and the videos and, and all that you're sharing on your school's website. So, yeah, if, if I can just jump in, Rick, the other thing I was remiss in not mentioning is um, some form of search engine optimization. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. you guys are both correct, but my point is always if they can't find you, it doesn't right. matter. Right. So, so yeah. there's got to be some form of that. You make a great point. I mean, if you go in and look at your web analytics, I think people will be surprised how people, how folks are entering your website. Like it isn't necessarily yeah. your front door, right? There may be interior pages that you had no idea was capturing a lot of search volume. And, you know, to your earlier point, Brendan, about landing pages, you may not necessarily convert your um, tuition page into a quote unquote traditional landing page, but you can certainly start to think about how you drive more value by answering questions and allowing and, and, and inserting calls to action that can help you get to whatever your objectives may be, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So as we build off of the website <laughs> and think about all that we can do with inbound marketing, you know, content marketing is, is a key. You know, it's, it's about telling your story or using different ways to be able to deliver content. So what are some of your key recommendations for how a school can uh, create content um, online as part of their marketing strategy? Yeah. Right, I mean, I, I think, no, I just keep thinking about what you've done with your eBooks, right? Like, I just think that's a prime example of how you can build a relationship through by answering questions and then ultimately benefit your pipeline, right? I, you should definitely talk about that. Yeah, I will. And, and I go back to, again, I don't get a cut of any of this, but <laughs> Peter said it first and bring it up. Here's the subline, why smart marketing is about help and not hype. Right. So the, the big thing with inbound is inbound in, is a methodology and there are techniques and strategies, but it's ultimately, it comes down to the fact that it's not about you. You know, it's not about the school like Peter was talking about. I mean, real faster, we haven't talked about it. The steps of inbound, develop personas, identify keywords, um, search engine optimization, content, and then social media is last. I know we're gonna talk about that. But in terms of that persona, uh, one of our personas, a made up woman named Ann Ramsey. Uh, I don't know who she is, we just made it up. But like, <laughs> what can we do to solve her problems? And, and that's the content that we need to create to attract her. So and, and to kind of build off of that, like when you're building that persona, you're not just saying, hey, here's Ann, Ann Ramsey. You're saying, here's Ann Ramsey. She's never been to a, a private school. She didn't attend one. She has no experience with this community. She's got two kids, 14 and nine. She, these are the five things that she values the most. Like you're actually thinking and in in building a whole kind of relationship with this person so that you can understand the kind of content that you need to develop in order to help, help Ann. Yeah, and and we're going down the rabbit hole, right? But um, you no, know, this is great. Of, yeah, there's a fictional representation of your ideal customer, right. prospective family, and and you'll start with one. You could have four, especially if you're a you know if you're boarding. Well, you could even a boarding school you could still four. Like, if you're a pre K through twelve like we are, it could be divisional. But you know, to Peter's point, it's really funny. And Ramsey, uh, we know is married. Um, both her and her spouse work because we need them to afford our tuition. They're first generation independent school family. They don't know our stuff. Um, they live geography north of us. Uh, they have children in lower school. Their pain points are that they need before care and after care. And um, transportation is a big issue. And that um, they're looking for a partnership because they value the education. But I think there's a little, I don't want to say guilt. But they want to be more involved because they value their children, they value the education, but they maybe feel a little guilty because they've got to work a lot. Right. So right. that's how we think of Ann. And when we started this, I found a picture of a woman on the internet. I don't know who she is, <laughs> but I put her up there. And when I was writing blog posts or writing emails, I was writing to Ann, dear Ann. <laughs> I mean, that's I'm getting down in the weeds, but 
you know, no, I was going to actually just ask you, how do you take the persona and then build out your content to try to reach that particular person that you've created? I'll just jump in fast. I don't want to monopolize it, Peter. So butt me out. But what we mm. would do is take an second step is keywords. So identify, and there's a bunch of ways to do this, but identify keywords that um, you think Anne would type into Google and your school should be in the top three slots. Right. Um, so that could be, you know, the example I always use is Pittsburgh private school. You know, I would hope <laughs> we're in the top <laughs> three slots, you know. Um, and then it could be, you know, transportation for school. You know, you build it out from there. And, and that's how we start. Peter, what are your... Yeah, no, I mean, that's the formula, right? Uh, yeah. You know, from our perspective at EMA, like we're building out personas too about schools that aren't part of our our membership and thinking about like what content can we develop to help them and we look at you know different types of schools and the kind of content that would matter most and once you start to understand who like and visualize who those folks are it becomes much much easier to think all right here are like the 10 pieces of content that i think that could be of incredible value and you can put data behind it too right like you can look at your internal metrics to understand you know what is most important to your current membership and extrapolate out what you know, would be important to, to this particular segment. And I'm guessing, Brendan, you did that with your personas, like you're looking at your parent population and understanding, you know, kind of kind of similar to what NAS is talking about with the jobs to be done, like where do people fall in these different categories and thinking, okay, we need to attract more people into these different, these tif different categories of, of interest. Yeah, we did we <laughs> initially, so learn from my mistake. We initially <laughs> sat down and, and we got all this data and all this stuff and all these reports and all that. So here's what I would say. We spent way too much time. And, and the, the problem was, is we created these personas initially that gave us, um, how's the way to say it, gave us data that wasn't actionable. So mm -hmm. for example, like, you know, you do some of these reports and you get, let's say Ann Ramsey, our, our woman likes to read town and country. Well, how is that actionable for me? We're not advertising. In That's a little bit, right? Yeah. You know, so so that was one. Um, and then ultimately, and I should go back to what you asked, Peter. The one of the the inquiry magnets, or what, what the guides that we call them inquiry magnets that we created, was designed to attract Anne. That was the twenty seven questions um, to help you evaluate a school for your child. Uh, we, we'll talk about that later, I think. But but that's how we did that. I did see one thing we should bring up, um, David writes uh yeah recommend more content ahead. be directed toward potential students um i'm not sure if this is what you meant david but we think of our external website as designed solely for potential families it's not for current families um oh there you go great hi david um you our portals are for our current families so be able to you know sometimes you'll hit, get heat from your internal audience saying, oh, this is on the, why isn't this on the website? Why is it, it's like the website is for external and the portals are for internal. Uh, distinction we take for granted, I think now, but it's something to talk about. Yeah, yeah that's great. Very good. Um, and, and we have a number of other people who've joined us. Just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Ryan and Karen, Regina, Mia, Adam, Julia, Michelle, William, and then David, who just had the question and Marie. So great to have you joining in uh, today. There's actually another question out there um, from uh, from William late to the call. Um, and he said, have you heard any issue about the Google reviews and what is and isn't going or getting through? Um, you guys want to comment on this? Well, first off, we're laughing because we know we know. Bill. And, uh, <laughs> is, he, is, he, is he setting you up or something? I, I don't know. No, uh, that that photo is actually legit. That's that's <laughs> that's, that's, that's still cool. like ninety eight percent of the time. Yeah. Peter, I don't know. Have you? I I did read a little bit about this, but yeah, you. I I I don't claim to be an expert on this. I mean, I'm sure you know more about this than I do. I I just know, and I don't really know fully because I saw it and was like, yeah, there's other things to deal with. But um, right now, Google reviews, they're not letting anything through, as far as I know. Uh, hmm. so remember they used to have ratings and now they've changed out a little bit, but, um, I think they've just, sh they shut it down. Um, and I'm not sure why I don't know the reasoning, but we currently aren't getting a lot. 
So it's one of those things that I just kind of, I don't know if it's good or bad, but I just push toward the back burner back burner because we have so many other things going on. And that's exactly what I'm seeing with other schools. So for some reason it's been shut down. Hopefully that'll come back, you know, down the road. But as you know, there's other key review sites that we can focus in on. So let's talk a little bit about social media. Um, you know, what's your advice for how a school marketing director or staff members should use social media to be able to tell a school story online? Brandon, I think you should tell the school perspective and I'd love to like talk about it from the parent perspective. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. I, I would just say, um, two, two things with social. Um, again, I'm going to hold my five steps. The fifth step is, is social media and, um, Social media should be used within the inbound context. So here's the way you do it. Um, and I'm going to go fast. You create content like a blog. You take that content and share it on social because what you're trying to do is drive people back to one of your web assets, a blog or a website, mm -hmm. where you have a call to action where people can convert. Again, that's the key. Anonymous prospective family, at least to an email. And then you get them in lead nurturing and, and you go from there. Um, the other thing about social is that, um, God, there's a ton there, but you know, we think of it in two ways. Uh, and we don't always post like this, but you know, one of them is the inbound marketing way, the recruitment way, post to drive back to web asset. And one is the retention way, which is about, I think more like telling your story. So we're gonna post something. I'm not trying to drive you away. I'll keep you in the channel. We're trying to reinforce your buying decision. Right. Um, and then the final piece, which goes a little bit baked in, is so many schools, and we don't always get this right, please, but, you know, I mean, the, the, the ideal, so many schools forget to make that ask. They forget to, to ask people to sign up to their event or, or drive people back to content or ask them to download the ebook. And I think that's a missed opportunity. But, Peter, I'd love to hear the parent thing. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, 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 my, my, my mindset around it shifted once we went through the the admission process, and what I found, what my wife and I and our friends, because you know we had a whole group of friends that were going through the process at the same time, <clears throat> what we all found was that we were literally consuming any piece of content that we could through social, all the way down to like going to a school's uh, YouTube account and watching student performances, because you know I, I think. You know, when you're about to make a large financial decision, you want to vet it and understand if you are making the right choice. Mm -hmm. And I, I find social to be such an amazing uh, delivery mechanism to, to tell that story in bite-sized, you know, chunks that are accessible from the thing that we're on all the time, right? So the more you can be authentic and tell that story in a, in a, in a, in a sequence kind of way, the better. And Frankly, it's more important now than ever. I mean, even if you're just doing throwback stuff, you know, just reminding people about the value of your campus, the value of your community, the value of the experience, as we're all sequestered and you know, you know, shelter in place. Like, I think we're missing that community piece. And I, right now, in my mind, social is an amazing way to channel that experience, albeit from you know weeks or months ago. But at least you can establish and maintain that connection. So, like. I, had you asked me the importance of social even like three months ago, I don't think I would su suggest it's as important as it is today, but it's mm. really important today. Like it is really important to tell that story. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very much so. And so that's great that you guys were able to, you know, highlight that because I think schools need to understand that social is a primary area to be able to share those stories. And um, as you talked about, Brendan, um, you know, call to actions along the way. Um, interested in your thoughts about uh, paid search campaigns? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'm still learning about paid search campaigns. I, I, have, <laughs> I, I I'd like you know varying degrees of success over the years. Um, Brendan, I know you've done a lot more with paid search than, than I have. Like, what what are you seeing on a school level? Yeah, I, I think um, initially, and it's probably in the inbound book. You know, they talk about <laughs> using. Um, you know, here are, the, here are the two big pitfalls with inbound. Pitfall is a tough word. Here are the two things you need to know. It's not a magic bullet. It, yeah. it doesn't happen overnight, right? So SEO and those things, taking content, sharing it. So it takes time. I'll come back to that. The second thing you got to watch out for is that um, inbound is like, a, it's like an engine and, and the fuel is content. So once you go down that strategy, 
you're going to be creating content, creating content, creating content. You know, example, look at EMA right now. They've been pumping out content to be helpful. We can talk about that later, Peter, but you've, it takes time. It, and there's a tool you've got to create it. It's a lot of time. Um, but back to that first piece about taking time. Initially, I, I viewed paid search as one of those, one of those things that um, was like a kickstart. So between the time that SEO kicks in and you start showing up in organic results, you could use paid search, whether that's Google ads or Facebook ads or Bing ads or whatever, um, to, to fill that gap. But, but I got to tell you, you, you never let it go. Um, you know, yeah. I think you just keep going. And then, um, you know, there's so many ways to, uh, so I would say, a, you know, a big time yes, especially now with COVID, we can't go anywhere. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think you have to be there. Um, yeah. And the only thing I would suggest is that if you, if you don't have the internal expertise to run paid search campaigns, it's okay to admit that you can't do it. Um, and I can tell you right now, we set about our paid search. Um, I know enough to be dangerous. Work now. And, and, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I said a lot of good people doing that work in our space now. Yeah, and I, I, we sub it out because, again, learn from my mistakes. You can lose, lose. You can lose a lot of money quickly mm -hmm. um, if you don't know what you're doing. And it's good to have an expert. You know, you just remind, reminded me of, um, I can't remember if it's in that book behind your left shoulder in utility or if that was somewhere else <laughs> in another book that I read years ago. But somebody used this, this concept of an information annuity, right? And this idea that you know paid gives you a head start, it gives you a lead, it's gonna generate a certain percentage of traffic to your site, and that's important. But the home run is if you can develop pieces of content that you know every day is gonna generate 20, 30, 40, 50 visitors um, a day, and it's remarkably consistent, like that becomes an annuity. It just keeps like that effort that you put into establishing that is exceptional piece of content, whatever it may be, is going to generate hundreds, if not thousands of visitors a year. And to, to kind of capture what that, the spirit of it, the, the, the author used this idea of an information annuity, it just like you paid for it up front, but then just keeps paying for itself over and over and over and over and over again. And, you know, that kind of uber piece of content, it doesn't happen magically. Like sometimes you just get lucky, but <laughs> when you do, holy cow, does that have pay big dividends, pays big, 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 big dividends. Yeah, I think you um, you both made some important points, but Brendan, one thing I want to do is piggyback on, and that's the the whole area of outsourcing. Um, you know, I work with a lot of schools, and typically I don't find the expertise internal at the school to be able to run their paid search campaign. And that's one area not to dabble in, but to make sure that you're investing in, because you want results. If you're going to spend the money, ultimately you want leads. Uh, that your admission staff can be able to work with and nurture along the way. So uh, if your paid search campaign is not producing leads for you that you can't track, then it's probably not worth that investment. Yeah, and that's right. And I, I, you just reminded me, like, if you're not tying a, a pay, paid search campaign to a landing page where you're converting, then it becomes, I mean, then you start to have questionable value about whether you should be doing it or not, right? Yeah. Rick, can you grab Sandro asked a question that oh. I think is very appropriate now. Sure. Um, yeah, here we go. There it is. Hi, Sandro. Vanity metrics. Here's how I'll explain it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you talk about vanity metrics, you like, and Rick, this is to your point. We got so many views, but, you know, we got a lot of Facebook likes. Um, but but my boss and Peter know when I started doing all this stuff and he puts up with all my, my crap with us, but he's like, man, I don't care how many Facebook fans we have. I don't care how many video views we have in course applications, visits, <laughs> you know, I mean, that for us, that's it. And I think that those vanity metrics are helpful at a lower level, just to measure your efforts so that you can, uh, can make decision and pivot. No, that's not working. Maybe we'll try this, but you got to tie them back to, and we do this every Friday we publish and then we compare back five years inquiries, applications, and visits. How are you tracking that? that do you, are you keeping a Google sheet or like, like literally what's the, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a spreadsheet. We just grab it and, um, 
we sh we just we share it every Friday, and it it's it can be a little stressful to be really honest because you you eye on the ball, man. You got to keep going, but if you want to make a change, that's how you do it. So, are you managing in a, in a, like a pretty dialed in editorial calendar, Brendan, or do you, are you leaving yourself flexibility, you know, each month to kind of pivot in different directions? Um, uh, flexibility. Flexibility. <laughs> we do we do plan out a few weeks. We don't go far because partly, you know, again, there's schools are notorious for never adding things to your plate and removing things. They just add them. Right. So, I mean, you know, Pete, like so. So we got so many things to go on. We meet, you know, there's a team of us that does this and we work through it. Uh, but, yeah, we're pretty flexible. So in talking again about paid search, one of the things that you made the linkage to are landing pages, but also downloadable content. Um, and you mentioned earlier about your um, a 27 question guide that you guys have been using at Swickley Academy for actually several years now, right? And so that's been a, a lead magnet for you. But to talk to me and our audience about the value of downloadable content mm. and what types of strategies you'd recommend that schools consider. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak highly enough about the, the value. It's I've had a lot of experience with this over the years in, in different in different ways. I think from a school perspective, you know, Brendan, what you did is you you just basically looked at the, the questions that you get regularly and and built a document that has answers to those questions. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's an FAQ packaged mm. in a in a helpful and helpful manner. So like it can be really intimidating to think, oh, how do I build this guide? You know, how do I do this? But like you already have a lot of that. It's a lot of the work's done. Like you, maybe you want to do a piece on financial aid, and like the five, t the seven best questions to ask about financial aid as you're going through the enrollment process, right? You can sit down with your financial aid director, or your CFO, or business officer, or whatever the title may be, and have a conversation about like what are the most common things that we're hearing, and what do we usually tell them, and then boom, you've got you've got your 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 answer and you can start to put you know a paywall or a, a wall behind it that requires you to give emails and your your name and then you can start to nurture them right i i, I think the if the content's there it's just a matter of what are the questions that you think you're hearing the most and how do you pivot that to align with whatever your internal goals are from an enrollment point of view yeah i mean we peter agree with everything you said i mean we Thought about it, um, you know, again, as we've identified personas, people that we're trying to attract, we would create a piece of content and we would brainstorm and go, what is, what, what, so let's go back to Anne. What is something that we could create that Anne would find so valuable she would pay for it? Right. But we're not going to charge her. We're going to, we're going to give it to her for free, but we're not really giving it to her for free. We're giving it to her <laughs> for her email address. Because the other thought is, you know, I think, uh, you know, back in the day, and I don't even know how far back now, um, you know, people would fill an inquiry form like it was nothing. Right. Um, the inquiry form for me, well, you know, I don't like the funnel. I've talked about that. But the inquiry form is way down the pipeline, way down the funnel, pick your term. I mean, that's like the end process. Um, when they finally raise their hand and go, okay, you can market to me now. You know, you are worthy. <laughs> um, and, and having these guides, uh, e-books, you know, and for us, it's about, Ideally, short, easily consumable, and mm -hmm. a quick win. Um, you know, people get at least initially. People are getting caught up in creating like, oh, we need a forty-page ebook. Nobody has time for forty <laughs> pages. You know, what I mean, if you guys ever downloaded and looked at our twenty-seven questions, it's it's like a three-page PDF with a bunch of white space. I mean, it's not. It's it's strategic, Peter. You're right. I mean, these were questions that we heard. We also baked in the soft sell to mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm who are our competitors, what are our advantages over them, and how could we ask or frame questions that would hide those advantages? Not all of them, just a few of them. And then our thought is if if Peter or his wife had downloaded a guide in Seattle, they would have found value in it. Now, they, you know, it's hard to commute to a day school in Pittsburgh from Seattle, but we'd love to have your daughter, uh, even though, you know, she's related to you. But it's, <laughs> it, it's they would find value. They would find value. And Hope she knows that you and I are long for, like old old friends. So this is how we normally talk to each other. Yeah. I, I gotta take a couple shots. Sorry. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the graying, you know, you guys look, or we're all looking yeah. older and older, especially if we, if we go through this COVID-19 and, yeah. you know, we're, we were talking, Brendan, about when we're going to get a haircut next. Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just shave it all off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that right. wasn't even me. I didn't even take a shot there, man. I'm good. Hey, it was never. If there's ever a moment in my life where I'm glad that I don't have to go get a haircut, it is now. Like, <laughs> I know. With, with, with fear, yeah. with fear and trepidation, trepidation, I ordered a pair of uh, haircutting scissors, oh, yeah. and I'm gonna allow my wife to try to test it out on me a little bit. Yeah, you know, clippers. <laughs> just take some clippers and you know, take it off. Exactly. You know, friend, but I, oh, sorry. I just want to build on one thing. You, you earlier on, you talked about the inquiry form, I mean, that is. I know this wasn't. This isn't the question that was being asked, but. That's something that I would encourage schools to really look at. Mm. The idea that, I mean, let me put it this way. In what other aspect of your life do you have to fill out an inquiry to make a mass, a major purchase? You're not, you're not doing it to buy a house. You're not doing it to buy your car, buy a new car. You're not doing it to go to Best Buy to buy a TV. Like you are doing all of this research up front, largely through inbound marketing because people are producing content that's helpful. I get the, the, the need in the kind of little the history of how the inquiry form has been part of our process. But I would certainly encourage folks to, to consider like taking a, a red pen and start crossing out the stuff that you don't need, right? You don't need, you know, the grandparent information. Like some of these inquiry forms are like, I can't, yeah, they're huge. I, my camera can't capture the whole thing, right? Like they're, they're pretty long, right? Um, you know, uh, what, what Brendan, I think you've uncovered and you certainly what, what we've done in the past as well is like you only need name, rank and serial number. And then the onus is on you, the enrollment person, to actually pick up the phone, email, establish the conversation, start to ask some interesting questions so that you can develop that rapport. They don't have to, like, fill out a pre like a mortgage application to uh, uh, send an inquiry to your school. Like I just from a customer service standpoint, think about that, what that would be like for you if you were on the other side. I don't know. That's just something I always, I feel like I always have to make that point. Yeah, it's a great point. We, we don't want a database to drive our marketing effort. We want the marketing effort to drive what we need to do with our database. So that's a good point. That's a good way of putting it. I like that. Yeah, uh, Hillary's asking a question about this downloadable content. How we how do we differentiate your content versus what other schools are doing? Um, it has to have re real value to be downloadable. Any thoughts about that? I'll take a stab. Um, I think one, if if your school, like for example, if a school in Seattle copied our thing exactly, it'd be fine because of day schools. I mean, you're just there's not a problem. Um, and we've had schools do that. And we've had schools ask and it's been fine. You know, they tweak it a little bit. Um, if it was in our, like if it was our main competitor, right. you know, <laughs> then you have to start to think through that. But the one word that I saw on there was value. Yeah. And it's, there's a little bit of a, a guess, I, I suppose, and that you're trying to decide, again, if I go back to Anne, what is valuable to her? And, and, and that's, like, I don't, she doesn't exist. I can't ask her. I mean, hopefully you're doing some research or talking to families that are at your school to kind of fill that bucket, but um, you've got to figure out what's valuable to her. Uh, I, I hope that answers the question. I, I don't know. Yeah. And it starts with the internal conversation, right? I mean, just a mission team sitting around a table and saying like, what, what are the questions that we constantly hear? Right. And, you know, that, that may spark um, inspiration to go in any number of directions. Yeah. So talk to me about uh, video. Uh, how important is video? How can be, it be used with inbound marketing? Well, I mean, we're on video right now, so I would argue that it's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty important. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different ways that you can approach it. I remember, Brent, you remember back in the day where you'd spend like $25,000 on a school video <laughs> and like, oh, like, like how many times a day, Brendan, do you actually just do like little like video clips and post to Instagram or, or, or Facebook or wherever right now? And just think about how far we've come. But, you know, you look at the statistics and, you know, people love to consume video content and mm. it gives you a chance to develop a really interesting voice around your school and your school's personality. It's a window in. So, you know, I, I, I think there's, there's a lot that goes into being successful with video. And I, I would actually put a plug in for a, 
company that I think does inbound marketing better than anybody, which is Wistia. It's W-I-S-T-I-A. So Wistia.com. It's a video. It's not, it's not like a super exciting product. It's a video player, but they understand but they use their video player to sell their, sell their product. And they, they, they're masterful at inbound marketing. So I, I use this example because years ago when I was started to get interested in video, I think the first thing that I did was type into Google, you know, how do you produce a, a good video? And guess who had an article about how to produce a good video? These guys at Wistia and they hooked me in and they just taught me and helped me go from step A to B to C to D to E to F where before I knew it, I had like a whole light kit and I you know, was using DSLRs with, with prime lenses and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. But they helped me along the way. And uh, as you're thinking about video and its importance, they're just there. They are the masters at teaching you, you know, what is what makes the most sense. So I, I would definitely check out uh, Wistia. I think it's Wistia.com, I believe. Mm. They have a whole learning center there. That's just really, really rich. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, bu I bought the same lighting kit. And so, Did you? Yeah, yeah. You, you probably shared it with me, but, yeah, but it's here's a, um, you know, I've seen some questions and I don't know if we're going to get to some of those, but you know, there's a practical yeah. reason um, for video. I mean, again, in the inbound framework, number four is content. So you're going to create content. Most likely that's a blog, <clears throat> could be video, but I mean, uh, I mean, Rick is eating his own dog food with inbound. I mean, this is inbound right here. Right. right? So think of, Rick, okay, former admission director, let's say, you know, the admission director of a school and Peter and I are parents or Peter and I are alumni and you're going Facebook Live to your school's page and having a conversation. The, the value of that is the content in and of itself, but then the value also from a social perspective is, you know, the, the organic reach. So the free reach on Facebook is what? What do they say now? Two to four percent. So two to four percent, five percent maybe of your fans um, who like your Facebook page will see this, will see a piece of content. Facebook wants to own video. So they're giving free organic reach to video posted directly to their channel, like not shared from YouTube or something else uploaded. And they're giving even more free organic reach to Facebook live. So from a practical standpoint, and it's a great play by Rick, we're having this fun conversation. I get to make fun of Peter. I get to catch up with Rick and so there's live value here, I hope, from people watching, but then this goes in their feed. So people that are like Enrollment Catalyst are going to see this again and again. And right. Again. So, I, so I hope that puts a point on why why it works. <laughs> and, I, you know, Elizabeth is asking an important question. Yeah, she wants to know how I'm grabbing the questions yeah, from the queue. This is cool. So I, I'm using a program called Be Live, uh, which is a, like a, a, a studio set that um, I can set all that up in advance. I can have up to three guests. Uh, with this program, I can um, push it out to one channel and it's limited to only Facebook or YouTube. There are other programs out there though that allow you to push out to multiple sites. Uh, so you may be interested in investigating those um, and uh, you can have more guests. So the possibilities are certainly there. Um, if you were on the uh, show that I did recently with the team from the Village School of Naples. Uh, Dennis Chapman, the head of school, is doing a, a program every Sunday evening called Leading from the Lanai. And so he's, he's, he's having this type of conversation with uh, people from his team, um, parents, uh, you know, other terminal school community, and it's exponentially increasing his reach because he's pushing it out through Facebook Live. So highly recommend that you investigate a tool like this to help you. Of course, there's a charge for this, but in the big scheme of things, it's minimal um, for what you're attempting to do and and getting your reach out there. So I know there's some other questions that have come in. Let me try to go through here and then give all of you an opportunity. If you have a question for Brendan or Peter uh, to be able to share that. And Trisha wants to know about uh, anyone that have families text as an inquiry. So maybe they text in to you, or then you could use texting as a follow-up tool to reach back out to them. Yeah, I don't know, Peter. I'll I'll start first. We yeah. we talked about it internally. We have not gone down this path. Um, our concern is um, uh, minors, um, 
you know, if we have kids that are, because sometimes we have kids in choir. So even though we're, you know, pre-K through 12, we'll have high school kids that are under 18. And we, we've just, we just haven't done it. I'm not saying it's bad. We just haven't added it to our repertoire. Yeah. I, I have not heard wide scale adoption of it. I mean, I'm seeing more schools use chatbots. The you know, I don't yeah. know if Brendan did use one, but but, yeah. but text is not something that I've seen used commonly. So I do have several schools I'm working with that are using texting. Cool. And so they, they might set it up through a, a service that you see a chat box off their website mm. um, that allows for that conversation to take place. Some schools are using Google Voice because mm. they don't want it going to their own personal cell phone. Mm. In some cases, uh, a school may be purchasing a cell phone just for the admissions director. And he or she can use that as a, a way to text. So I haven't seen problems or issues. Uh, you know, a key stat that I saw recently, you know, 99% uh, of text messages are seen uh, versus, you know, 33% of emails being read. So it's an opportunity to think about to get in front of your uh, prospective parents along the way. So. Let's see, other questions. Um, let's see, Bill's asking the question about how do you balance WISTA with YouTube in terms of exposure and the fact that YouTube ranks so high in search? Yeah, I mean, I look, the game is played on YouTube for sure. I think, what is it, Brandon, is it still the second world, the world's second largest search engine? Yeah. I, you always ask the question in a presentation, like how many of you been on YouTube to get to, to learn something new in the last 30 days and look like every hand yeah, right? Exactly. I, I was there yesterday how to install a, a, a ceiling fan switch, right? So, you know, there's there's lots of reasons that you want to be there. I think what 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 you what separates Wistia is it really is for kind of a business application, meaning, you know, they have all sorts of integrations into services like HubSpot or other lead generation CRM type tools. And it allows you to build in calls to action and and the ability for people to you know hand over you know information to engage with you further. So and, and uh, you know, honestly, the, the the analytics are so rich that it makes you a better videographer because you understand you know kind of consumption patterns. So um, it, it's it's a balance for sure. You definitely want to have content up on YouTube because you want to be there when people are searching for things that are relevant to you. But as somebody who's like kind of working the enrollment piece of it and understanding that they have metrics that they have to uh, adhere to, Wistia can certainly play a role in terms of feeding those. I would just add that um, for us, Bill, it would depend on use case. So um, if we're using it, like there have been times where we've uploaded natively to YouTube. And then we've also, because we're Wistia customers, um, probably because of Peter, but we're using them. So we've uploaded to Wistia, and then Wistia's embed and control are, are, are vastly superior to YouTube, um, and the analytics are unbelievable. Uh, the other thing, at least initially, although YouTube has gotten better, is we weren't really fond of the YouTube suggested videos at the end of the video. Mm, uh, right. So if it's on the public channel, you know, and, and the other thing we struggle with too is we're creating a lot of videos, but they're not as well. We're not, but you know, we're we're doing what we can. And if you're not having a full uh, kind of strategy or campaign on YouTube, might not be the place to be. Like I would argue, you know, I always say be on Facebook and kill Facebook. And you might just want to upload natively to Facebook and leave it there. So. I think it's complicated and I would say, Bill, to give you a crappy answer, it depends. And it's probably, <laughs> it's probably use case. Yeah. So Mary's asking a question, if you read down further uh, about, will this uh, live broadcast be recorded? And, and one of the great things about uh, sending out a broadcast on Facebook Live is that it's automatically recorded. So it's placed on your timeline. So you'll find it on my enrollment catalyst page. Uh, and also my previous live shows that you may want to go and, and be able to uh, listen to the interviews because there's been some good ones um, along the way. And this certainly has been a great one as well. So as we kind of wrap up here, uh, I'm interested in just hearing, you know, any advice uh, that you guys want to share uh, about inbound marketing to school admissions and marketing leaders as they think about what they need to do and how they need to do it. There's so much you can do. Yeah. Um, so what advice would you guys lay out for them? Yeah, I'm going to fly the plane a little bit higher and kind of 
look look above inbound marketing. And we're in a period of American history and world history that I just don't think in modern times we can point back hmm. to anything similar. And you know, we're looking at data internally here. We're talking to a lot of schools. I think it's just going to be a bumpy 12 months ahead of us. And if I were sitting in a school admission office right now and thinking about how am I going to navigate these waters, you know, I'd be thinking a lot about innovation. I'd be thinking hmm. a lot about how do I improve my entrepreneurial skills because, you know, there's going to be opportunity here, right? Whenever there's crisis, there's opportunity. And to be able to embrace that opportunity, you have to kind of shift the mindset from we've been doing it one way for a long time to, you know what, I'm going to throw that all out the window and I'm just going to open my brain and I'm going to think differently and take some chances. And I think I was on a call, gosh, a couple of weeks ago, like no, we're at a point right now where nobody is going to um, fault you for trying. Right? Mm. So my my hope is that schools will really embrace that entrepreneurial spirit and understand that they may have to do some pivoting and to be able to do that thing we really have to take the moment now to think about how do we build those entrepreneurial skills because for many of us we weren't hired for that purpose like we were hired for a different purpose now we're being asked to do something else i just hope that people won't get you know that that they like, push aside the intimidation and instead think about it as like wow this is something that i want to embrace and you know, I, I think really interesting things are going to come out of this. Like our schools are going to look different. And, you know, there could be ways that we improve our schools that we had never even considered before. Hmm. And to me, that's 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 the thing you got to grab onto. I, I agree with everything you said, Peter. I would just add, um, to use your analogy, I'm going to bring the plane down a little bit. Uh, you did say it. Like, <laughs> we're not going to get faulted for trying. So if you've been right. thinking about inbound, just 100%. do it. Just yeah, yeah exactly. And, and right. come on, I'm going to do it again. I need to get a cut of this. Yeah, you I should. Need to book and read it and uh, get to understand it. Just learn about it. Learn about inbound. And, and I, I tell people to buy this. I'll show it again. Because is there an affiliate link tied to this? I mean, it'll be on my blog. Yeah, it'd be good. So it, um, we, I don't know, great way. We screwed up how we started. I mean, to be really frank. Um, we didn't do it like, you know, again, I've talked about a path. We didn't follow the path um, for any number of legitimate reasons. Um, so just learn from my mistakes. Get the book, read it. You got lots of time. You're not going anywhere. Yeah. And start to play. Because, again, I'll end like I started. You can't screw this up. Um, people just won't pay attention. And then all you do is that's actually not a screw up because that's data to then pivot and try something else. Yeah. So just, just, just learn about it, try it and go from there. Fail forward. Right. That's what I teach my kids. Right. Just yeah. Fail forward. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's exactly like what I'm doing here. This was something brand new. I had to pivot and I, I wanted to try something. So I tested it out among some friends and then in a private group that I have, you know, some, some more friends and then I went public with it right. and it, it's been great. So yeah. it's been you know, a great opportunity. Yeah. To have a conversation. So, so cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Well, I really appreciate uh, Brendan and Peter being a part of the show today. Uh, and certainly you guys can reach out to them. In fact, maybe Peter and Brendan, if you could maybe put your contact information uh, in links in the uh, comment section, uh, either off after the broadcast or, or now, that would be awesome. Um, but my next show is coming up or next week. So Monday at noon, uh, I've invited uh, three of the team members from School Admin. Oh, cool. uh, School Admin, yeah, they're a, a great enrollment management database system. And uh, what we're going to be talking about is lead nurturing. So how can you develop a system for follow-up once you generate those leads? And so I'm looking forward to that conversation uh, I have many schools that use school admin and, and certainly love that platform uh, along the way. So again, thanks, Peter and Brendan. It's been great to see you guys virtually like this. And maybe next time you'll be clean shaven and, uh, you know, there won't be as many gray hairs uh, for us <laughs> along the way. Who knows? But uh, uh, thank you again and uh, best wishes to everyone out there and uh, stay safe. All right. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. See you all. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Appreciate it.